All right, everybody, welcome to the bus stop with Chris and Drew. We're here to talk a little more shop. And today we're going to talk a little shop about a common conversation in the mass transit discord channel, which is ultimately how do I organize my code? But today we're kind of going to pick on uh, a project known as clean architecture. And I feel like in the .NET space, this one has some legs. It's been talked about a lot. There's a lot of different names it goes under. But Chris, I know you probably get this question quite a bit, so I'm going to ask it right now. And uh, you tell us what you think. So the question is, I'm implementing mass transit in my project, and I'm trying to follow the guidance of clean architecture. Where does mass transit go in my project? You know, that's a great question and a good topic to cover because, you know, we, we've all been there and, you know, it's it's like, OK, well, I've done some experimenting and now I want to make sure that everything is perfect, everything is polished, everything is right where it belongs and it fits. And I want to make sure that I adhere to, you know, the clean architecture standards and the inter interface segregation principle. And you start pulling out the solid principles and you pull out the book and you start reading through and, you, you know, you've got you know, 85 shiny hammers in your packet and you want to make sure you use every single one of them because, you know, it, <laughs> I got the visitor it, badge. That's right. That's right. I got the visitor pattern badge. It's time to move up, you know, time to skill up. It, it's a question I get a lot. And, you know, for people who've been on the channel for a while and have watched the videos, there's a lot of common themes in like the samples I put together, you know, it's, and I do that on purpose because yes, the samples are small, but I try to make them, you know, as realistic as possible. I mean, if I was just, if I was just Microsoft, I would just say file new project for demo X and it would just wizard create it and put it all in one project. Uh, but that's not the case. I mean, I typically look at the different aspects and when I rebuilt Mass Transit V8, I looked at the way that I was using the library and how people were using it to ensure that I got a good separation between the dependency free Mass Transit abstractions assembly and the Mass Transit assembly itself. And if you think about that from like a clean architecture mindset everything in abstractions is dependency free that package has no dependencies whatsoever so things like new things like i consumer a lot of the setup and configuration and consumer based interfaces everything that doesn't require something beyond the base class library is in that package and the reason for that is because i think a lot of people like to write message contracts or they like to write consumers or some of their you know, actual business logic code with as minimal dependencies as possible. Because when you think about step back, what is this clean architecture? Well, the clean architecture, it's gone by a million different names like onion architecture. It's gone by clean architecture, a uh, hexagonal architecture by um, Coburn. I'm trying to remember his first name. Alistar. Alistar Coburn. It's always kind of been around this concept of, and even in the DDD book by Eric Evans, you have this concept of a core domain in the middle which the last thing you want to do when you're building application is make your core business logic dependent upon now obsolete version of Microsoft service ABC. Unless that service is a core part of your business. Yeah. Or yeah. Or if it's a core enabler, I mean, you know, if you're building a health analytics application and you're leveraging Google's health API to do some of that artificial intelligence identification of health conditions or things like that, yeah, obviously that API is going to be a core part of your business. And so how would I then, like, where does mass transit go in this case? If I'm trying to, you know, I'm organizing my, I'm organizing my code to be more concrete. I have a solution in Visual Studio. And I, I feel like clean architecture is telling me to have multiple projects. Sure. And so, like, where do I put MT? So, so let's kind of look at some of like the sample code. I'm mentally walking through some of the sample code. If I was building an application, and I'm going to talk in, so there's there's this mindset of microservices, and there's this mindset of like monoliths but that there's the happy medium that i think people are starting to realize both from a deployment and management perspective is there's this idea of this well-factored or well-groomed monolith you know when we think about you know is it bad to have a solution with 18 projects in it and those 18 projects represent six business domains and they're all completely isolated but communicate with each other through specific message contracts Maybe that's a thing. And I, I, you know, I find that in my development history, that's significantly more manageable than having six different solutions and six different GitHub repositories with 
all sorts of builds and deployments. And then now we've got the shared NuGet package with all the different interfaces in it. And just the tooling of the development loop is horrible in that. So let's talk about the well-factored monolith case of where I say I have a single solution. I have maybe you know less than 10 projects in it. The key projects that I'm going to look for when I'm organizing mass transit code is I'm going to have a contracts package. This is where I'm going to put my message contracts. These are going to be shared by any other project that's either producing or consuming those contracts. And those contracts are going to be owned by the, you know, message contracts are either owned by the producer in the case of events or owned by the consumer in the case of commands or requests. So. Think about that and keep that in mind. Some people will take that to the nth degree and say, oh, well, I'm going to create a contracts project for each business domain. Not a bad thing. OK, whatever. I mean, it's it's your code, but keeping those contracts isolated from the actual application, because that's your public interface. These are things that you're going to use to communicate with other components within your architecture. And I generally don't use mass transit interfaces, attributes, things like that in my message contracts. But sometimes I do, and that's what that mass transit abstractions assembly is for. If I need to pull that in to get like attributes to say, hey, this is an internal contract, like I event message, and I don't want an exchange created on the broker for that, I may put the exclude from topology attribute on that, which is in the MT assembly. Totally cool, whatever, doesn't matter. The next package that I'm going to create, or I'm sorry, not package, but the next assembly or project I'm going to create is going to be like the components package. And this is where I'm going to put within a given business domain. So I might have like company.accounting.billing. And that might be all the billing components within my package. So that dot components project is going to have things like consumers, state machines and state machine states. Uh, routing act slip activities, any of those business components that are ultimately going to be connected to some transport database, whatever. And I'll keep, typically keep those separate. The only package I might reference is mass transit in that case, because I'm using you know a lot of the things in there, but I'm not really getting specific to a transport. And that kind of goes in with the clean architecture. You know, I have my business core domain that is using the MT primitives like iConsumer, things like that, but I'm not dependent upon say RabbitMQ or Azure Service Bus or Redis. You know, so that's that next layer in there. Um, the interfaces, you know, again, are used by those components. But now we get out to the services layer, and this is where we're starting to talk about infrastructure. This is where the add mass transit call is. This is where the using RabbitMQ call is. This is where I'm actually wiring up all of those business components to infrastructure, whether it's, you know, a broker or a database or things like that. And I'm going to have a number of service projects equal to the number of, you know, API services or backend services that I'm running. So that's that's kind of like the three core assemblies that I'm going to have, you know, as far as using the mass transit code. Yeah, and I would, I agree with that mental model of, I also tend to break up my projects by business function, by like large business function. Mm -hmm. And depending on the organization I'm working at, working on, working at, uh, I also will look, if I can, I'll try to make those projects align to a leader in the business. So that way, ideally, if there's a question, right, I can go to that business leader who has the ability to decide, like, what, how should this behave? Is that like Conway's law level? Like, hey, this is this is finance or this is accounting. I mean, is, does uh, that come into play or? It's definitely an acceptance of Conway's law, like at the organization level. It's I think if you start to look at. Wow. OK, I didn't think we were going to go here. Um, <laughs> when you look at like project management, one of my big beefs with a lot of organizations is. Uh, you know, they want to use like a framework around like whose whose responsibility is this? Who's informing? Who's advising? Like there's you know, uh, the good old racy frameworks. chart. <laughs> uh, but in the end, for me, what I what I want to know is like, where does the buck stop and who's going to like make that decision? And so if I kind of align the software to that very human oriented organization model, then it becomes really clear, like, what should something do? Well, it's it's servicing, like, this organization. So a quick little story uh, at the bank that I worked at, the 
business, the bank was largely divided by into two broad sections, risk takers and risk avoiders. And so when we started to orient uh, our code around that division in the business, there were certain areas that, that used to be really complicated because we would, in one project, we'd go ask, we happen to be asking a risk avoider how we should do this. And they would say, do whatever. And then we, the next time around, we would ask the risk taker and they would be like, no, 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 no. It needs to be like this. And so this business was, a, was built this way to provide that like pushback and forth friction. When we split the, the applications up and we made them communicate via messages, just like they did on the third floor where they would be like, hey, Bob, I need a thing. Like, it just became so much clearer and the contract between those organizations became so much clearer. So, uh, yeah, I definitely organized. So back to where, how did I get down this road? I organized my contracts uh, definitely by the business unit and I have them communicate via messages whenever possible. And that could be HTTP messages. It could be MQ messages, but it's a defined contract. For sure. Jason is Jason. You can put it anywhere. Just make sure it has a shape. It isn't just a dictionary of string string. Yeah, hopefully. Hope it has yeah. a schema. Schema. That's a good way to put it. A structure. I think of, you know, when mass transit's always pushed interface messages, and now that we have records, I don't even really use interfaces anymore. I mean, internally, they're still there. But, you know, it's it's like, it, it's a schema for that message. You know? So, yeah. So I guess another thing that I just thought of that kind of comes into the code structure, you know, on top of contracts, components, and, you know, your individual, you know, API services or wherever you're hosting and, you know, connecting your rabbit and saying, you know, I want to configure these consumers in this process because they're doing certain function. There's also this notion of, you know, ye old kitchen sink, AKA mm -hmm. the shared package, you know, the common I, library, the common library, <laughs> you know, cause if you're going to have 15 services, you're likely going to want to have like an infrastructure level set of extension methods to like configure RabbitMQ the same way to pull the pull the credentials from Key Vault or, you know, some sort of key management system. You know, all of the things that make you special for your business and the constraints and the third party, the basically the integration to all the other third party services you're using. It might be pulling Kubernetes secrets, whatever. It doesn't matter. Your shared services. Exactly. Like back to a business, right? Like you have the shared services department. Yeah, your cross-cutting concerns, how to configure logging, how to configure a log sync, how to configure open telemetry, what the server is, all of those known name environment variables that you don't want to cut and paste into every project, you know. So uh, there's definitely the case of like a business.shared project that might take dependencies on both RabbitMQ and Azure Service Bus, and it will look and say, hey, if environment variable run local equals true, then configure it for RabbitMQ. Otherwise, if it's running up in Azure Kubernetes, it might say, hey, that environment's not there. We know we're connecting to the Azure Service Bus side. So that kind of kind of takes away some of that repeated code from all the different services that your developers are building. And we've all had, we all have a shared, a common, a core, a whatever we call it, it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. And you might see different mass transit packages pulled into that, like the Entity Framework Core, maybe Azure and Rabbit, you know, anything that you would have there. So yeah, that's that's probably the fourth package that commonly comes into play when you get beyond just a single service is you don't want to repeat that configuration. I've also seen some people put some really complex, you know, their own routing systems and stuff in there, you know, ways that they're like, hey, we're going to use mass transit this way. We want to feel a little different. And that goes to the question, you know, someone else had asked is, and this is kind of one that I always push back on when people ask is like, well, I don't want to have mass transit referenced in my core domain. I want to create my own abstraction for mass transit. Yeah, and this, this, this is well, something that, go, go, go. Yeah, it's. <laughs> We, we've definitely seen this with, um, you know, iRepository. It's my abstraction on top of the database. And even though you're using in Hibernate or now you're using EF Core, it's like, I, I feel like I need to use this iRepository. I would argue that iRepository came from a time when we were using, like, the, the database, the ADO.net directly. But mm -hmm. now that we're using... EF Core, now that we're using in Hibernate, there's not as much value there to put the abstraction on top of the abstraction because that is kind of like, like your iRepository is the iSession in, in Hibernate. It is the, uh, the DB context in EF Core. Uh, 
And in Eva Core's case, it's even your unit of work. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I kind of feel the same way about mass transit. I mean, mass transit's interfaces and such are, are, are simple enough. I mean, like I consumer is pretty simple state uh -huh. machine complex, but you're modeling complex business logic. You're doing orchestration. So, oh man, can you imagine trying to write an abstraction over <laughs> you like couldn't. any, like go look at in service bus, go look at Wolverine, go look at mass transit. And like, you want to write an abstraction over something like that detailed. Like that's, that's a whole effort on its own that has, that is not providing value to your business. And is going to be leaky as a sieve. I mean, you're going to have so many constructs passing through that that abstraction layer. It's just not worth it. Uh, which I also, how are we doing on time? But we can go another little few minutes. There's so I've been talking to some younger developers, and this is something that just blows my mind. Um, there's a lot of younger developers, younger in terms of like not necessarily like age age, but like development age. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're like, no, I don't develop locally. Like, no, I just program straight against the, like, there's zero abstractions. <laughs> they're, you know, they're just slinging code straight against a remote service that they have to have a network connection all the time. Right. And, and they're shipping code and they're making money. So like, no shade, no shade to them, but it's just such a different mental vibe than when I, like when I was in their development age. And I was putting interfaces on top of everything. And I'm like looking at the clean architecture layout and I'm like, oh, I absolutely had an I use case. I absolutely <laughs> had I entity. Like we I am did. seeing 25, 27 year old Drew, which is probably when I read hexagonal architecture. And like, yeah, I, I went hard down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was an era of it. It was. But you think about iRepository too, that's when less than 1% of Microsoft customers were using dependency injection. Oh, it, yeah. it, was, it was only the, the elites, you know, the alt.nets that were doing it. And, I mean, and, and I've seen it too. I've seen people pasting JavaScript into the Azure Functions UI and saying run. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. when you think about, like, if you were using CSLA.net back in .NET 1.0.1.1, Right, like that was the they were providing an abstraction on top of collections as the persistence mechanism. Yeah. And so you, the goal was like, how do you think of this as just a pers like a collection that just happens to persist? And iRepository was a really good way to mimic that on top of a database. Who was it that wrote that again? Was that Rocky? Rocky Laka. That's what I thought. Yeah. Well, hey, hopefully this has been a good discussion. If you like what you've heard, you know, definitely, you know, or if you have some comments and say like, hey, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, definitely drop that down below. Um, th this was fun. This was kind of a random one, and I, I appreciate those kind of things. So, hey, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you at the next bus stop.